85 years ago today, the Nazi German regime or orchestrated a wave of nationwide violence over two days that targeted German Jews. Rioters were given free reign to set fire to synagogues, destroy businesses owned by Jews, and attack Jewish people in their homes. This event came to be known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, because of the shattered glass that littered the streets of German towns when the sun rose the next morning. All of this violence and destruction happened in plain sight, and although many people were shocked, very few intervened to help their neighbors as their houses of worship burned and their homes were attacked. Still, others took the opportunity to join in assaulting Jews and looting property. Today, we mark the anniversary of Kristallnacht amid a surge in violent anti-Semitism worldwide. Kristallnacht was a government-sponsored riot, but the horrors of November 1938 feel especially resonant now at a time of profound fear and grief for Jews wherever they live. Good morning, and thank you for joining us to learn about this turning point in the Holocaust. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. I'd like to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Daniel Green, historian and curator of the museum's special exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust. Together, we will discuss the impact that the Night of Broken Glass had on Jewish lives and how it was a critical event on the Nazi path to genocide. Welcome, Danny. Thanks, Edna. Viewers, please send your questions about Kristallnacht and this history to Danny in the comment section, and we will answer as many as we can during the program. So to begin, after the Nazis came to power in January 1933, they implemented increasingly harsh measures uh, against Jews across Germany. These included legalized discrimination and waves of public humiliation. What was different about the night of November 9th to 10th, 1938? The Nazi regime's persecution of Jews had been going on for more than five years as they were incrementally imposing restrictions on all aspects of their lives. For example, Jews were not allowed to practice their professions, educate their children in German public schools, or marry non-Jews. Their exclusion from society was quite comprehensive by 1938. There had been attacks against Jews in the streets and other public places, and there was a pervasive fear of violence among Jews. In November of 1938, the whole nation erupted into a new level of violence. Kristallnacht was a coordinated event that occurred nationwide on an unprecedented scale in large German cities and in very small towns, even those with only a handful of Jewish residents. Nazis attacked Jewish places of worship. They destroyed countless Torah scrolls and Jewish ritual objects, and they vandalized and set fire to hundreds of synagogues throughout Germany. Many synagogues burned throughout the night in view of both the public and local firefighters who had received orders to intervene only to prevent fires from spreading to nearby buildings owned by non-Jews. No matter how many times I hear that fact, it always is just so chilling, the idea that what we would call today first responders are told to only selectively apply their uh, life-saving skills. Um, it, it's just very, very disturbing. Uh, but of course, the damage wasn't limited only to synagogues. What other places did rioters attack? Jewish cemeteries also were desecrated during the chaos of, of Kristallnacht. Nazi paramilitary thugs and, and members of the Hitler Youth across the country shattered the windows of an estimated 7,500 Jewish-owned commercial establishments and looted those shops. Rioters also attacked Jewish people in their homes, destroying and and stealing personal belongings, terrifying families, assaulting innocent people for no other reason than being Jewish. Uh, but the cruelty didn't end just with those two days of violence. Tell us how the Nazi government financially penalized the German Jewish community for the crimes that had been perpetrated against them. Yeah, in the immediate aftermath of Kristallnacht, the German government absurdly claimed that Jews were to blame for the riots and ordered them to clean up and pay for the extensive damages that had occurred across the country. To shield German insurance companies from bearing the cost to repair extensive property damage, the government confiscated insurance payouts to Jewish policyholders and instead imposed a fine of 1 billion Reichsmark on the central German Jewish community. That's the equivalent of about 8.7 billion US dollars today. 
this, this massive penalty imposed on the Jewish community fit with the Nazi regime's propaganda, which operated by blaming all the ills of the, of the world, of society, on Jews. And this uh, forcing of the Jews to bear the tab for what was done for them, it went down to the local level. Uh, a local historian in the German town of Breisach recently said that the Jewish community there actually received a bill for the gas that was used to burn their own synagogue. So as you said, just the, the absurdity and the added humiliation and cruelty of it was intense. Danny, help us understand how Kristallnacht and the financial penalty imposed afterwards impacted Jewish store owners, individuals, like a man named Bernhard Bormann. Yeah, Bernhard ran a successful business in Magdeburg, Germany that had been in his family for over 30 years. Offenbach Leather Goods was a popular, reliable, and was known for its high quality goods. During Kristallnacht, Bernhard's shop was ransacked and the windows were shattered. Because insurance companies were not covering damages inflicted during Kristallnacht, Bernhard had to pay for the extensive repairs with his own money. And uh, I think here we're seeing the invoice uh, to repair the damages. We have a question here actually from a descendant of Bernhard from his grandson, Brent. Brent writes in to say, a young German friend told us that he was taught in school that Kristallnacht was a euphemism and that the correct term for the event is simply a pogrom. How has Kristallnacht been reframed in modern Germany today? And thank you for that question, Brent, and we are very honored to pay tribute to your grandfather today. Danny, I'm gonna take this question if it's all right with you. Yep. Uh, today, Germans and many other Europeans actually refer to this violence instead uh, by the name the November pogrom. They believe that the Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass doesn't fully capture the horrors of that evening and the fact that there was violence not just against property, but also against human beings and the ways that it shattered lives. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the term pogrom, we've been hearing it a lot in the news lately online. It is originally a Russian word that means to uh, wreak havoc or to demolish violently. And historically, the term has been used to describe violent and often deadly attacks against Jews in Europe. So November pogrom, if you see that, that refers to these same events of November 1938. Thank you, Brent, so much for that question. I also want to pause and Danny let you know where some people are joining us today and watching the show live. Good morning and thank you for being with us from Cary, North Carolina, from Arkansas, from Wildwood Crest in New Jersey, Yorktown, Virginia, and Westwood, Massachusetts. We are really glad that you are here with us. I'd like to return uh, to Bernhard and to another part of his experience though. Uh, the human toll, of course, of this night was very vast and very painful, and Bernhard was among some 30,000 Jewish men who were arrested and sent to concentration camps on this night in November. Kristallnacht was the first time that Nazi officials had made mass arrests of German Jewish men merely because they were Jewish, without any pretense of a charge or a trumped up crime, they just did this wholesale. And many, as we see in these photos, were paraded in front of burning synagogues or deliberately humiliated by crowds uh, before being sent to concentration camps. So Danny, while Bernhard and most of the men who were arrested were eventually released, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, some of them actually died in custody. Please tell us what happened to one person, Nathan Froelich. Nathan Froelich was a 55-year-old Jewish man who lived with his wife, Elise, and their three sons named Albert, Hans, and Max. He was a custodian at the Stuttgart Synagogue and was there when it was set on fire as onlookers shouted death threats to Jews. Nathan escaped and hid at his sister's home in Frankfurt, but he returned to his own home quickly because he was concerned about his family. Two hours after he arrived, the Nazis arrested Nathan and sent him to the Dachau concentration camp outside of Munich. Nathan was among the 11,000 newly arrived Jewish prisoners who were either crammed into overcrowded, filthy barracks or forced to sleep outside in the cold. They were also subjected to abuse and beatings by Nazi guards at the camp. After Nathan became ill and went to the camp infirmary, the guards accused him of faking his symptoms and threw him out into the cold. Nathan died in Dachau on November 15th, less than a week after Kristallnacht. 
what a horribly sad and tragic story that he died even if the um, deliberate murder was not the goal. He obviously died because of the brutal treatment that he received just days after being wrenched from his family. Um, may his memory be a blessing. Danny, I wanna look at sort of the larger ripple effects of some of these arrests though, because they obviously devastated not only the 30,000 Jewish men taken into custody, but also the people who loved them and who didn't know where they were or what was happening. Tell us about one man, please, named Leopold Baer and how his arrest changed his family forever. Yeah, Leopold Baer was a decorated World War I veteran who had served in the German army. And after the war, he lived with his wife, Josefina, and their two children, Kurt and Ilsa, in a very small Jewish community in Bossum, Germany. For years, the family had enjoyed a normal and tranquil life in their little town. But when Kurt and Ilsa became adults and the Nazis ascended to power, the two of them moved to British-controlled Palestine. But their parents, Leopold and Josefina, were still living in their home in Germany when Kristallnacht erupted. Rioters smashed the windows and doors of the few Jewish homes in town. The SA, the violent paramilitary unit of the Nazi party, dragged two Jewish women through the streets while singing anti-Semitic songs. And Leopold and two other Jewish men were arrested. So he's taken away. What happened to his wife, Josefina? Well, Josefina was left alone and she was traumatized and terrified. Two days after her husband was taken from her, she wrote a letter to her children. This is the letter and it says in part, my darling children, with a heavy heart, I have to part from you. Yesterday, they took father. I cannot cope with all this. It hurts me terribly to cause you pain. We are all suffering. Stay together. And if our beloved father comes back, give him all the love that you saved for me. My last thoughts are of you and above all, my beloved husband, forever, your mother. And Josefina took her own life after mailing that letter to her children. It's very, very hard to listen to, hard to imagine the um, trauma that her children would feel upon receiving that, being so far away, knowing they couldn't help her. But it also reflects just her utter despair and horror that she felt there was no way out. And there were many deaths uh, that happened either on Kristallnacht or happened as a result even though the Nazis' main purpose on the night of November 9th to 10th was not murder, German officials later attributed approximately 91 deaths to the violent attacks of that night. Many historians believe that the number of victims is most likely higher, and countless Jews succumbed to their injuries in the days and weeks that followed, while others, like Josefina Baer, died by suicide. We have a question, Danny, from a viewer named Mary asking, was there any pushback to the violence and bigotry from newspapers in Germany then, or was the hate already baked into the culture? Um, we actually see the opposite of um, pushback to to the violence. We, it, it, um, there, there may not have been vast widespread support throughout all of Germany, but um, the newspapers and the messaging around this are carefully controlled um, by the Nazi party. And so, uh, as, as I mentioned, the Nazi party propaganda operates by um, blaming Jews for anything, uh, all, the, all the ills of society, and, and they do the same um, with Kristallnacht. And as a follow-up to that, how did average non-Jewish Germans react to the violence and destruction that's happening right there in their neighborhoods, right there in front of them? Yeah, well, public opinion reports from Germany gathered in the aftermath reveal that the reactions varied widely. As we saw in the opening video to this program, some Germans cheered as synagogues burned down, but others hid Jewish friends or coworkers in their homes or businesses. Police officers in small towns in central Germany saved Torah scrolls and other sacred objects from synagogues. Some Protestant and Catholic Germans condemned the destruction of synagogues because of the religious significance of those places. Other Germans objected to the violence and destruction of Kristallnacht, but not for altruistic reasons. Some believe that destroying property was an unnecessary loss of wealth for the German nation as a whole. 
Some were worried about how the violence would be perceived by other nations and how it might affect foreign policy. Other Germans were concerned that the violent events might even prompt too much sympathy for Jews. But in fact, there was little outpouring of sympathy for Jews anywhere in Germany in the wake of the attacks. Even though some Germans may have been shocked by the violence on Kristallnacht, almost no one spoke up or protested publicly. Danny, I'm going to pause again to welcome additional viewers we have from overseas. Uh, thank you for joining us from Sintra, Portugal, and from Gran Canaria in Spain, and additionally more viewers from across the U.S. in New York City, in New Orleans, Louisiana, and in Memphis, Tennessee. We're glad that you're here. Um, thinking about these American viewers, actually, Danny, you had mentioned concern by Germans about how these events would be perceived outside of the country's borders. And I would like to turn to our country, particularly given your expertise as curator of our Americans in the Holocaust exhibit. What was the initial response like here in the United States? President Franklin D. Roosevelt denounced the attacks a few days later, saying publicly, and this is a, a quote from him, that he could scarcely believe that such things could occur in a 20th century civilization. The United States also recalled its ambassador to Germany and were the only nation to do so in the aftermath of Kristallnacht. Newspapers in the United States covered the story for several weeks. No other instance of Nazi persecution up to that point received such extensive coverage from the American press. And one headline that aptly summarized the danger for Jews under the Nazi regime was published on the front page of the Los Angeles Examiner on November 23rd, 1938, two weeks after Kristallnacht. It reads, Nazis warn world Jews will be wiped out unless evacuated by democracies. In a public opinion poll conducted in the, in the US two weeks after Kristallnacht, 94% of Americans who answered said they disapproved of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany. But 71% said they did not want a larger number of Jewish refugees from Germany coming into the United States. Those polls in the weeks after Kristallnacht well encapsulate Americans' response to Nazism at this moment in 1938. Although Americans almost universally condemned the Nazi treatment of Jews, they didn't want to open the doors of the United States to Jewish refugees. So this kind of yawning gap between sympathy and action. Uh, for context, I want to make sure that our audience understands that at the time, U.S. immigration policy was based on quotas, quotas that set a ceiling on the number of people who could come to this country based on their country of birth. And this is something, um, the next thing is something that shocked me when I learned it as a historian, I guess I should have known, but that in the 1930s, the U.S. did not have a policy for taking in refugees or asylum seekers to consider someone's safety or if their life was at risk as part of consideration uh, whether or not to admit them. So that that is really disturbing, especially when we think of our country as a, a place that gives safe haven. Again, I want to bring this down to the personal level, the relatable level, because these actions, these policies, or lack of action had real consequences. Danny, please introduce us to a boy named Frank Cohn and his parents, and how they managed to gain entry to the U.S. during this perilous time. Well, Frank and his parents, Martin and Ruth Cohn, lived in Breslau, Germany. They quickly felt their comfortable and secure lives change after the Nazis came to power. A boycott against Jewish businesses in 1933 prompted Martin to sell his sporting goods store and take up a new trade selling cloth to Jewish manufacturers to make ends meet. Frank, his son, was 13 years old in August 1938 when his father Martin left for the United States on a business trip. It was almost impossible, as we've been saying, to get a visa to enter the United States without a sponsor who agreed to ensure that a Jewish refugee would not become a burden on the depressed American economy. Martin's ultimate goal was to find a sponsor so he and his family could immigrate to America. While he was away, the Gestapo came looking for Martin in his home in Germany. Ruth, his wife, was so frightened that she quickly applied for a tourist visa to the United States to join her husband, and she bribed a German consular clerk to add her son Frank's name to the visa so they could travel together. Ruth then purchased tickets to travel from Holland to New York by boat, and the German authorities only allowed them to take one suitcase 
and 10 marks each, which was about $2.50 at the time when, when they left. They were reunited with Martin on October 30th, 1938, less than two weeks before Kristallnacht. Incredibly lucky timing, although of course they could not have known that um, at that moment. Uh, in the wake of Kristallnacht, President Roosevelt actually did something highly unusual. He waived the expiration date of temporary visas, of visitor visas, for some German Jews who just happened to be in the U.S. at the time. And he said he could not, in any decent humanity, send people back. Let's listen to Frank Cohn, in his own voice, explain how that policy decision changed the course of his young life. Every newspaper in the States carried the news which we anxiously followed. It was a great tragedy, but ironically, not for us. After that pogrom, no more Jews were forced to leave the States to return to Germany. Our visitor's visa was extended indefinitely. The timing of our escape was indeed a miracle. We were saved. So this decision by Roosevelt was an unusual one against the backdrop of America's uh, much more closed door policy. And it was an incredible alignment of both good fortune and circumstances that saved Frank and his parents, as well as we believe around 12,000 other German Jews who were in the U US on temporary visas at the time. Uh, we know from Frank, who is a volunteer here at our museum in Washington, that while he and his parents were very fortunate to find safety in the U.S., 11 members of their extended family were killed during the Holocaust, the people that they left behind. Other family members from the Cohen family managed to immigrate to any country that would take them in, as far ranging geographically as Brazil, Haiti, Holland, and Australia, so a real scattering. Danny, we have another audience question. A viewer named Michael is asking, how did other countries react to the news of Kristallnacht? Kristallnacht is, is shocking news uh, around the world, um, not only uh, in Germany and the United States. So like in the United States, newspapers around the world covered the story for weeks, often on the front page. Some people protested the Nazi treatment of German Jews. In Argentina, for example, some Jewish-owned stores were shuttered in protest of Kristallnacht. At least one neighboring store also closed in solidarity and posted a sign that we're seeing here stating, we are Catholics and we feel the pain of our Jewish brothers. International outcry was widespread in the immediate aftermath of Kristallnacht, but most governments did not actively help German Jews. One thing that I may be surprised think may be surprising to some viewers is the Nazis were actually uh, concerned by what world opinion would be. Um, how did the Nazis and their government in interpret the fact that most of the international community failed to go anything beyond paying lip service, condemnation of the violence unleashed during Kristallnacht, but in fact did not take any real action? Well, they weren't they weren't immune to caring about what others thought. They did care what other nations thought. They they paid close attention to the world's overall reluctance to get involved on behalf of Germany's Jews. And so, Kristallnacht is a sort of litmus test for uh, Nazi Germany. When they saw that the doors to other countries remained overwhelmingly closed to Jewish refugees who were fearing for their lives. Germany's propaganda ministry instructed German newspapers to convey a simple message about after Kristallnacht. And that, that simple message was, nobody wants the Jews. And the Nazis certainly took this lesson to heart and emboldened them over the coming years as they moved from persecution of Jews to systematic murder and eventually genocide. Um, Danny, I'd like to turn to another German Jewish family whose harrowing experience during Kristallnacht prompted them to leave their home country as quickly as they could. Please tell us about a little girl named Jill Berg Pauli and her loved ones. Sure, Jill, who is the little baby in this family photo that we're seeing here, lived with her parents, uh, Joseph and Clara Berg, and the, her older sister, Inga, in a small town about 20 miles from Cologne. They were a religious family who'd been living in the same town since the 17th century. A few years after the Nazis assumed power, they took control of Joseph's successful cattle business, and Jill's life was turned upside down the night that her synagogue 
was set on fire during Kristallnacht. Uh, Jill is someone who you and I have both met. She is also a survivor volunteer at our museum. And looking back decades later as an adult, Jill was talking to uh, visitors in our museum in 2014, and she vividly remembered that night. Uh, let's listen to Jill describe what her family did when they saw their neighborhood synagogue set on fire. The minute my sister and I walked out the front door, we smelled smoke and it was gray. We got petrified. We started screaming. I think we saw the flames at the synagogue. It was only a block and a half away. So my grandmother took us into the car and made us face down on the bed of the car, and she put her feet on us. She was very resolute, my grandmother. She really had it. And my grandfather got in the car and put his feet on me so that we couldn't get up and we couldn't look out of the windows and we couldn't see flames because that terrorized us. It's just a, a wrenching scene to imagine these grandparents physically shielding their young granddaughters from seeing chaos and destruction. What happened to Jill and her family after they drove away from their hometown that night? Their home was ransacked and many of their personal possessions were destroyed. After driving away from the burning synagogue, Jill was reunited with her parents in Cologne, where they stayed with her uncle. Twelve family members crammed into his apartment as they figured out where to go and what to do next. A friendly non-Jewish shopkeeper helped Jill's mother smuggle food for the family over the next few months. So they were really in desperate straits, uh, dependent on the kindness of others even for their daily meals. And even though the Berg family, like so many, they were on a wait list to emigrate to the U.S., they decided that they just could not wait for an unknown period of time. Where did they end up going? Well, Jill's grandmother took charge again, this time enlisting help from a relative in England who had ties to a law firm in Kenya. Kenya was a British protectorate under the Crown's colonial rule at this time. The British government wanted farmers to move there to help develop their farmland and promote economic growth in the country. So Joseph's expertise in the cattle business likely helped convince the British colonial office authorities to permit the family into Kenya. He went ahead and made arrangements for Jill and other relatives to join him in May 1939. 19 people in the family took advantage of this opportunity, though relatives who were over 70 years old were denied entry into Kenya because of their age. The boat trip to Kenya took two weeks. The Nazi captain asked Jill to sing for the crew every night, and her aunts also on board were frightened that Jill might sing in Hebrew and jeopardize their safety, but thankfully for them, she didn't. Shortly after arriving, the family purchased 500 acres of farmland using money that Jill's grandmother had smuggled out of Germany into Holland five years earlier. They lived in two large houses on the farm where they raised cattle and grew plants, and Jill and her family quickly learned both English and Swahili. Despite some anti-immigrant sentiments, they generally felt safe and happy in Kenya where they stayed until 1947 after the war. An absolutely incredible trajectory. Uh, Jill's grandmother, Clara Berg, saved the family over and over. She displayed so much resourcefulness, ingenuity, a matriarch doing whatever she could uh, to protect her loved ones. And Clara and her husband, Max, actually lived their final years. They died in Kenya and were buried in Nairobi not long before World War II ended. We know from Jill that although 19 members of the Berg family were able to flee Germany via this perhaps unlikely escape route, Jill also remembers waving goodbye to some 60 or so other relatives who they had to leave behind. And Jill was very grateful that her grandparents never found out that many, if not all, of those people had been killed during the Holocaust. A viewer named Stephen writes in to say it is important that you bring these personal stories to us. And thank you, Stephen. That is one of the main points of this series, of these programs, to help to put uh, a face and the actual real individual human relatable impact behind statistics that otherwise can seem very abstract and very overwhelming. Danny, before we close, I'd like to return to Bernhard Bormann, the leather shop owner who we met briefly at the beginning of the program. The night of Kristallnacht, the night that Bernhard's shop was ransacked, he was arrested 
and sent to the Buchenwald concentration camp. What happened to Bernhard and to his family afterwards? So Bernhard, like many Jewish men arrested during Kristallnacht, was released from Buchenwald two weeks later on the condition that he leave Germany immediately. He and his wife, Minnie, began planning their family's escape as soon as he returned home. And in a matter of months, Bernhard, Minnie, and their four-year-old daughter, Leah, boarded a boat to Asia, eventually arriving in Shanghai. Visas were not required to enter Shanghai, so it became a popular destination for many Jews desperate to leave Germany. Shanghai's refugee population jumped from about 1,500 before Kristallnacht at the end of 1938 to nearly 17,000 one year later. Bernhard and Minnie recorded the first few years of little Leah's life in a baby book, and Minnie wrote about the life-changing impact that Kristallnacht had on their lives. She wrote, I decided to hurry to Shanghai after your poppy was sent to Buchenwald for 14 days on November 10th, 1938. On March 21st, we went to Bremen. The next day we were off. Parting from our dear loved ones was difficult. They lived in Shanghai with other Jewish refugees until 1947. And those are really very beautiful artifacts uh, showing a young family just trying to survive. And even though there were so many obstacles to leaving Nazi Germany, many German Jews still you know, were able to find some safe havens in countries around the world. I'd like to recognize other viewers that we have, people who are tuning in from both Howard University, just down the road from us here in Washington, DC, and from the Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation. We are glad to have you. Also, a couple of comments, Danny, from viewers. Judith writes about so much tragedy and heartache, such evil, and Martha says, thank you for all you do to reveal the truth. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Martha. Uh, it is our, our privilege and honor to do this, even as it is painful history to discuss. Danny, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today to mark the 85th anniversary of the Night of Broken Glass and to make really vivid for us the devastating impact that it had on so many people, on so many families. Thanks, Edna. I think it's so important to tell these individual stories. And of course, these are just few of hundreds of thousands of lives that were shattered in Germany on that night. And as Danny described to us, the Nazis interpreted the apparent indifference of the German people to mean that they wouldn't object to even more radical actions against Jews. We know now, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, that the shocking violence unleashed on November 9, 1938 was in fact only a step on the road to even more brutal and massive crimes. And we also know from their own words that Nazi officials felt emboldened by the silence and inaction of both people and governments around the world. Today, as anti-Semitic threats and violence surge, the lessons of this history remind us of the deadly dangers of unchecked hatred. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time.